Both last week and again today, we are talking about one of the more controversial chapters in all of the Bible, and that is Revelation chapter 20, especially the part that speaks about the millennium or the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ. Uh, last, year, last week in worship, we talked about different views of the millennium, and those are laid out for you again in the bulletin if that is a helpful resource for you. We won't track with all of those views as we did last week, but each one of those viewpoints, be they the dispensationalist or the premillennialist or the postmillennialist or like Lutheran Christians are, the amillennialist viewpoint, focus upon Jesus Christ and how he reigns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so as Lutheran Christians, historically we have understood the millennium, the 1,000-year reign, to be apocalyptic language for referring to the total, complete reign of Jesus Christ over all things, that right now he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He's reigning right now. And from thence, from that point of God the Father's right hand, he will come again on the last day to judge both the living and the dead. And so right now, Jesus Christ is reigning in the hearts and lives of his people. He's reigning in your heart and in my heart as we trust in him. And one day when he comes again at the end of all things, every eye will see him and every knee will bow before him and acknowledge that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and he is God over all. We look forward to that day. We look forward to that day in confidence that Jesus Christ is coming again and he's coming again soon. And so in this latter part of Revelation chapter 20 that we'll dig into today, we see what will happen right before Jesus returns and then what Jesus does when he will come again in great power and in glory. And so we open up to Revelation chapter 20 and we start with verse number 7 as the Apostle John, the follower of Jesus, records these words for our benefit. When the thousand years, the millennium, is over, Satan will be released from his prison, and he will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. At the conclusion of this 1,000-year period of time in which we are right now, there will be what many call Satan's little season. A period of time where Satan, who is the bound, prisoned, imprisoned enemy of God's people, will be let loose for a short period of time. And persecution that has happened for 2,000 years against the Christian church will be ramped up, it will be elevated, and the suffering of God's children will not decrease, but will increase right before Jesus' final return. Now, many people throughout 2,000 years of church history have argued that they were living in Satan's little season. And in many ways, people are saying that right now. As we see terrorism, as we see persecution, as we see people in a culture that used to be more friendly to Christianity now start to be progressively more opposed to Christianity. And so whether we are in the final season of Satan and his final assault upon God's church, or whether we, like our ancestors, are in a microcosm, a small little taste of Satan's final assault, we don't know right now. But what we do know is that Revelation teaches that after Satan has waged this final assault against the church, he will remind us of a great blessing in our life. That through the struggle and through the pain that we will encounter as being opposed in, with such great fierceness by Satan himself, we will receive a blessing. That in the struggle, in the temptation, in the hardship, in the persecution, that there is actually a blessing and the blessing is to be reminded how fully, completely reliant we are upon Almighty God. Now, let's face it. We all as Christians would say that we know we are 100% reliant upon God for everything, right? 
We know that for food and drink, for house and home, for wife and husband and children, for land and animals and all that I have, as the catechism says, we rely upon Almighty God. And we can say that right now as we're gathered together in a church assembly, but how we actually live our lives oftentimes would say something else. Oftentimes we act as if we are in charge, that we are self-sufficient, that we've got things under control. And yes, we need God to come in and fill the cracks once in a while, but otherwise we've got it all together. Well, what the Bible describes in Revelation chapter 20 is a season in life in which you're reminded that you don't have it all together, that you can't do it on your own, that you need to rely upon the help that comes from above. Some of you might be in that type of season right now. And Revelation chapter 20 says that that type of season, that type of assault both on our spirits and on our bodies will happen over all of God's church right before Jesus comes again. And the blessing amid the storm will be that we will know and experience how completely reliant we are upon the hand of our gracious God. That we will have to stop putting up this false front of saying that we've got it all under control And we will admit and bow the knee before Almighty God and say, we need you and we need your help right now. Now that's a reminder for us as people that we are pilgrims, that we're nomads, that we're people that really are are wandering in the journey that we call life. It's always been that way for God's people as you track with their story throughout the 66 books of the Bible. God's people are always on a journey It's been that way from the very creation of all things, and it will be that way until the completion of all things at the return of Jesus Christ. Did you notice what John said? It says there that the devil and all of the evil forces from the four corners of the earth will wage war against God's people. They will march across the breadth of the earth. They will surround the camp of God's people, the city that he loves. You see, the enemy will surround us with the forces that want to cause us to despair and give up and throw in the towel to curse God and just die. But in the midst of the storm, we're reminded that we are but strangers here. In the book of Hebrews chapter 13, the writer to the Hebrews says this about where God's people find their home. He says, for here in this period of time, for here in this little season of life, for here on this earth, broken as it is, we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking forward to the city that is to come. Have you ever had someone say to you, where are you from? I get that a lot when I meet new people. They'll say, where are you from? Last week, a guy said that I have a Southern Illinois accent. I've never heard that before. He said, oh, you speak with a Southern Illinois drawl. And I said, well, well, you have a Hoosier accent, and I hope you know what that is because it is very, very noticeable. A Southern Illinois accent. So people would say, well, where are you from? Now, like me, many of you have lived in different places over the course of your life. So how you choose to answer that question says a lot. Do you say where you were born? Do you say where you grew up? Do you say where you spent most of the years of your life thus far? Where are you from? What city do you call home? It's interesting to note that the city that we are called to call home is not here. That the city where God's people are protected by His almighty hand is the city that is to come. It's the place where Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I am but a stranger here, says an old hymn. Heaven is my home. That my home, my place where we'll all be all right, where we'll all be okay is not in this life and in this season of struggle, but it's with the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming kingdom. I'm but a stranger here. Heaven is my home. While we are strangers on the face of this earth, wandering from place to place, we will come to a point in time where Satan in his little season of power will bring all of the forces of Gog and Magog, not two biblical names that I'd recommend you name your children. Right? These are not good ones. And what do they mean? In the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel refers to Gog and Magog as the forces of evil that wage war against the Israelites. And so the forces of evil that wage war against God's people, it's an image that is found in the Old Testament, and John, like he does with many of his apocalyptic images, borrows it 
So Gog and Magog refers to any kind of power that's opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ that the devil will use. In our day and age, I think it's fair to say that Islamic terrorism, like ISIS, is Gog and Magog. I think in our day and age, it's, it's, it's the cultural temptation to say, well, anything goes, Gog and Magog. The Christian church are just a bunch of judgmental hypocrites, Gog and Magog. Any idea, any attitude, any political structure that is opposed to the biblical truth of Jesus Christ that is a tool in the arsenal of Satan is Gog and Magog. But here's the good news. That on the day of Christ's coming, after Satan gets his little season to wage his full final assault, the unholy trinity will no longer be able to terrorize you again. No longer will Gog and Magog be able to be used by Satan, and no longer will Satan himself be able to deceive and cause you to despair, for there will only be the reign of Jesus Christ and the life that he gives. Look at verse 10. It says that even after Gog and Magog are destroyed and that God's people are spared, the devil himself who had deceived God's people was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, the same place where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented there day and night forever and ever. So now do you see what's happened? The unholy trinity of Satan, of sin, of death are all completely destroyed because Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, who's living and reigning to all eternity, will come again and will completely demolish the enemy once and for all. And that terrorist named Satan will never have power over you. Hallelujah. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And it is a word of hope for those who trust in Jesus Christ, that Satan himself will be defeated and gone from you forever. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, wrestles with the idea of how can a good God allow such horrible evil on the face of his planet. And he talks in this book about God's hell that he has established where those who reject him will spend eternity apart from him. And Lewis points out that when Jesus Christ describes hell in the Bible, that he often describes it in three different ways. Hell can be described as a place of punishment, a lake of burning sulfur and fire, a place of destruction where constantly are, are being destroyed. So punishment and destruction. But then a third way is privation, meaning that something will be taken away forever. And so hell as privation means that when people have rejected Jesus Christ, they will no longer experience His blessing anymore. And it means that the privation for Satan on the day that he himself will be judged by Jesus, that he will no longer have any opportunity to deceive or manipulate or tempt the people of God. The terrorist will be taken down once and for all and banished and destroyed in hell forever. And that for you and for me is very good news. After the little season of Satan, Jesus returns, and this is now the focal point. Verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and I saw Him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from His presence, and there was no place for them. Then I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. You see there what the focal point is here again for us as readers of this revelation. The focal point is the great white throne and the one who is seated upon it. That nearing the end of Revelation, we now go back to the beginning of Revelation where we see that the Lord is seated upon his throne. That God the Father is seated there with the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, with him. And he is the one to whom every knee should bow. He is the one before whom all of the 24 elders lay down their crowns. And he is the focal point again. He's never stopped being high and exalted. 
but sometimes we move our eyes away from him. Here we're called to put our eyes back on him where they're supposed to be all along, to see that God is reigning even in my struggle. God is reigning even in a world that seems to be going to hell in a handbasket. God is reigning over all, even when people don't acknowledge him as their king. The Lord God Almighty is the focal point. And when Jesus Christ returns, it says that every person, each and every person, will be called before him and judged according to what is written in the books. It says that the dead will be called before him. Those who are left alive at that point called before him. The sea will give up their dead, meaning those whose earthly remains could no longer be located. God will make a way. Both the great ones and the small ones, the kings and the rulers, the paupers and the peasants, both those running for president and those who are asking for handouts on East Washington Street, the Donald Trumps and the Hillary Clintons, the Ted Cruz's and the Bernie Sanders, and yes, even the John Kasich, who for some reason is still around, all will be called before him, and every eye will see him, and every life will have a book opened. That book that will be opened is a way of saying that God knows all things. He knows all of our actions, all of our deeds, all of our words. Nothing in all creation is hidden from His sight. And when we stand before the judgment seat of Almighty God and give an account to Him, what will be our plea? The plea that we will make before the throne of Almighty God is not to say, God, go to this chapter and look at this line and see all the great things that I've done. No, I think that in humility we would say, God, please don't open. <laughs> please don't open those certain chapters of my life. Please don't look in those pages of what I've done because I know what I've done and I do not deserve to be in your presence forever. But there will be an acquittal. There will be a declaration of not guilty over those who trust in Jesus Christ. For those who say to Jesus Christ, I am a sinner, but you are holy, and I thank you for saving me by your death and resurrection, there will be an acquittal, meaning your name will be found written in the Lamb's book of life. And God's judgment will be based upon what's written in that book and what Jesus Christ has said about you. Not that we of our own can say, God, I am here because of my worthiness. But Jesus Christ would step in and say that we deserve death but he's taken upon that death upon himself. And that we do not deserve life, but in a great exchange, he takes the life that is his with God and he hands it to us as a pure free gift. So that this then shall be my only plea, that Jesus shed his blood for me. That God declares righteous those who trust in him and those who have had their names written by Jesus in the book of life. So something to consider. When you stand before Almighty God as each person in all creation, both past and present and into the future, will do, will you be judged on the basis of your actions or on the basis of Jesus' actions for you? Those who have rejected Christ, the judgment will be based upon their actions and those actions alone. And we know that no one is worthy of getting into heaven on their own actions. But those who cling by faith to Jesus Christ, that eternal judgment is declared based upon Christ's actions on your behalf and your life connected to His, hidden with Christ in God. Colossians chapter 3 is a powerful, powerful chapter, and I encourage you to think about these opening verses of Colossians chapter 3. It says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. So when you go through the little season of life where you're tempted to just give in and give up and be destroyed, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, you died to sin. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You see that? Your life is incorporated into Jesus Christ. You are in Jesus Christ. His life is your life because your death became His death. Look at verse 4. So that when Christ, who is your life, who is your life, appears on the last day, then you also will appear with Him in glory. You see that? 
that your life is Jesus Christ, and when he appears, you will be judged on the basis of his actions for you, and you will share in the glory that is his and his alone. Don't you love it? I love that passage. Set your hearts and minds on Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 20 ends with something phenomenal, and it's the death of death itself. So that all that is left as we turn the pages into 21 and chapter 22 is life. Look again at Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. It says that when Christ comes again, then death and Hades, that is the realm of the dead, were also thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death, referring to everlasting condemnation. So finally, death, which has put a chokehold around every single family on the face of the planet, death that many people fear, death itself will die and that Christ alone will live and give that life to those who trust in Him. I think about that death of death as I consider some words that I'm privileged as a pastor to speak at the graveside of many saints as their earthly remains are laid in the ground and as we celebrate with them the eternal life they have with God. As dust sometimes is scattered over the casket, as mourners, as family members and friends gather around, words from the Apostle Paul in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians are spoken, and those words go like this. Then the end will come, when Christ will hand over the kingdom to God the Father after He has destroyed all dominion and authority and power, for He must reign until He has put all His enemies under His feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. You see that? That death itself will be destroyed. That death itself will be known no more. The unholy trinity thrown down. And what is left? Only life. And friends, I've got to ask you, who doesn't love life?